Good morning. Today is the second in the Project Hope series, and today I thought we should talk about persuasion. Now, what is persuasion? Persuasion is where you're trying to convince somebody of something you want them to change their view on. Now, why do we have to do that? What you have to realize, okay, <clears throat> and if you're a child, you have to realize that when you are born, you're born into a certain uh a certain society, a certain group of people that have certain ways of looking at things. Now, as you grow up, you're going to meet people who are born in other groups that are other cultures, other races, and who have other ways of looking at things. Even though we're very similar, we're actually also very different. Now, in order to get what you want from other people, you have to persuade them. Persuade them means you have to convince them to give you what you want. And when you're learning how to write essays, essays uh, can be about two things. They can be about giving information or they can be about argument, like this, uh, basically persuading someone of something you know and you believe in. Now, <clears throat> the reason we have to do that, like I said, is because we all grow up in different cultures and different societies. Now, you have to develop one of the things your education, your teachers are trying to develop in you is something called critical thinking. Okay, now that's a, that's a big word, but critical thinking is basically about not just accepting everything you hear as truth. Now, the thing is, like I said, we're all born into different cultures. And when we're children, when we're babies, uh, one of the things you'll notice in child development is that when kids are about two years old, when they're babies, they don't argue with you. <laughs> uh, they just cry. Okay, a baby cries when they're hungry, when their diaper needs changing, when they're uncomfortable, when they're hot, they're cold or whatever. If they're uncomfortable, they cry because they don't have the words to express what they need. As soon as a child, a baby hits about two years old, they start getting a little bit more independent independent in their thinking. Uh, they question. They, the, their favorite word becomes no. It's called the terrible twos. And it's actually a very important milestone in a child's growth. Every child should go through the terrible twos. And during the terrible twos, basically what the child is doing is they're trying to um, establish boundaries. Okay. They want to do what they want to do. And they don't understand why a parent would say, no, you can't do that. Like if they want, uh, if they want ice cream for supper, they don't see why they shouldn't have it. And in fact, a, a toddler, a, a two-year-old doesn't understand exactly what is good for them. So that's when parents have to step in and set limits. And those limits are actually very important. Now, <clears throat> each society <clears throat> has different limits. They have different social uh, ideas, like not not widely. Like they, there are some things that are consistent over all different cultures, but for the most part, there are different societies. They have different limits, and for example, the way they dress, the way how much clothes they wear, um, if they pray, all kinds of stuff. So a child grows up not really questioning their reality around them. But as soon as that child goes out into the world, they will meet and interact with other people who have different ideas. Now, the thing is that right now, Western societies, uh, basically kind of like white countries, they kind of feel like what the way they do things is the best way. And that's because they have more uh, wealth and more privilege than most of the rest of the world. But in fact, Every culture can actually learn from each other. Now, when things are, when, when one society is dominant, they, they tend to get to the point where they don't feel like they need to persuade anybody. They just want to order, well, it's our way, do it our way because it's the best way. And so they stop actually learning from other cultures, even though there are other cultures that could teach them certain things. Like, for example, in this current pandemic, <laughs> Uh, there's been such a run on toilet paper, which is really weird, okay? If you think about it, all, of all the things that people have been hoarding, they've been hoarding toilet paper. And people from other cultures, they have to laugh. Because, I mean, white culture, in, in, I mean, in Western culture, 
uh, basically the way you clean your bum is with toilet paper. And in other cultures, they might use it for drying themselves, but they don't actually use toilet paper to wash, to clean themselves. They actually use water, <clears throat> sometimes a hose, or sometimes it's just a jug, to wash themselves down there. So this is actually something Westerners could learn from other cultures, because it's cleaner to wash yourself down there than to use toilet paper, okay? I mean, if you got disgusting stuff on your hand. You wouldn't just wipe it with toilet paper. You would wash your hand. So anyways, so this is just one way where the dominant culture could actually learn something from other cultures. And they have. They might have been learning this stuff. Um, okay, that's just one example. And then there's things from uh, personal cultures that we can learn from Western cultures. Like, for example, when I was growing up, there was a lot of misogyny in my culture. I'm from Pakistan and stuff like that. And they, they would often look at women like, ah, oh, you can't do very much. So that's something that's been changing because we've looked at Western culture and, and said, no, no, women can accomplish a lot of things. That, and they have the same kind of brain and the same kind of uh, capacities that other people have. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a back and forth. It's an exchange of ideas that we can learn from each other. So when you're trying to persuade someone, what you have to do is you have to think about who you're talking to. Here is where knowing your audience is very important because it depends on who you're talking to. If I'm talking to children and I'm trying to persuade them about why it's important to wash their hands, I'm going to use language and I'm going to use ideas that they can comprehend. But if I'm talking to a bunch of teachers or intellectuals, I'm not going to use the same kind of ideas or examples. For like intellectuals, if I try to talk to them like I would talk to children, they're going to look at me and think, who the heck are you? <laughs> so when you're talking, when you're trying to pers persuade someone, first of all, you have to think of your audience. And when you're thinking of your audience, there's two things you have to keep in mind. What is their currency? Now, currency, C-U-R-R-E-N-C-Y, it's a fancy word, um, and it usually means money, because currency is actually something you value now, and most people, they value money. But in this case, I'm not talking about money. What I'm talking about is values. Everybody has their currency. And a good parent, when they are persuading their child to listen to them, they will also use currency, the child's currency. And one of the child's currency could be like, I mean, if, if, you, if you're not listening to your parents and you refuse to accept whatever boundaries they're trying to put on you. And remember, most of the time parents are trying to put boundaries because they see a danger that the child doesn't see. As a child, you don't necessarily know all the dangers out there. Your world experience is limited. It's one of the reasons why sometimes strangers can um, convince, persuade children to go with them into a dangerous situation where they sometimes the children are abducted and horrible things happen to them. It's because a lot of the time children trust adults and they don't have the life experience to know that not all adults have your best interest at heart. <coughs> if you look at folk tales, one of the things the folk tales were often doing were they were warning children in a in a story way, like using story to warn children about strangers. Okay, like like Red Riding Hood is about don't talk to strangers. Okay, because you don't know what information you're giving them. Like she, Red Riding Hood tells a stranger that she's going to go visit her grandma. So then the wolf goes and eats the grandma and then eats her. Okay, whatever. So <clears throat> these folk tales were there to, to teach children the idea that not all adults can be trusted without questioning, without reducing the authority of the parents. Anyways, so... When, when you're dealing with strangers and when you're dealing with other people, how strangers would persuade a child is that they would uh, entice them with candy or, oh, say, I have a sick puppy or something like that. It's because that stranger knows that the child's currency is like candy. They want candy or they would want to see a puppy or something like that. So even in that situation, there is persuasion going on. Now, <clears throat> When you have people trying to persuade you, you have to keep your, your, your mind open. You have to keep your mind open. And you have to look at what's going really on, what's really going on. So sometimes 
And the most important thing that a, a, a person can use when they're talking to someone to persuade them is they use their voice. And in terms of voice, intonation, which is the, intonation is like the rise and fall of your voice. It can, it can, it can have a lot of authority to it. Now, if you have three sentences with different punctuation, if you're writing something and you have three sentences with different punctuation, say you have a sentence, a very simple sentence, it's not my fault. Okay. Now, what if you had three different ways of punctuating that? You could end with a, a period, you could end with a, an exclamation mark, or you can end with a question mark. Now, and the intonation in those sentences is going to be different. It it could if if it's a question mark, the intonation will go. It's not my fault, you know, because when we ask a question, our voices go up at the end. Okay, it's not my fault. Uh, and and then it could be just with an exclamation uh, mark, with an exclamation point. It would be it's not my fault, and with just a period at the end, it would be it's not my fault. Now, out of the three forms of that sentence, it's a very simple sentence, it's not my fault. Which is the most powerful in terms of authority? Which one is the most persuasive? And it, the answer might surprise you. Well, for one thing, I, I'm sure you figured out that the question mark it would not be very authoritative, not be persuasive at all. It, it's not my fault. Doesn't sound like it's not my fault. It actually sounds like I'm questioning whether it's my fault. So that one, forget it. And it's not authoritative at all. Um, but out of the other two, it's not my fault, the, the exclamation mark, and it's not my fault. Which is the more persuasive? It's actually the one with the simple period, not with the exclamation mark. When you put the exclamation mark in your sentence, it actually reduces the persuasiveness of the, of the sentence. It actually reduces the authority, which is kind of unusual because, and especially as an immigrant coming, I would have thought it would be more forceful, but it's actually not. It's less forceful. So for example, if you say, it's not my fault, it's not as powerful as if you say, it's not my fault. Because it's not my fault where the sentence is level and your voice doesn't go up or down at the end is actually more authoritative. Okay. It's not my fault. That is more authoritative, authoritative than it's not my fault. Because it's not my fault, the exclamation one has emotion in it. So when you're trying to persuade someone, and watch it when people are trying to persuade you too. When people are trying to persuade someone, the, to using too much force actually raises up the person's uh, skepticism, which a skepticism is like you're questioning, okay? So if I say, it's not my fault, it sounds like I'm trying to, I'm being defensive and I'm trying to argue with you. So the most authoritative version of that sentence is, it's not my fault. That actually gives the most persuasive argument, which is ironic. So when you're writing an essay <clears throat> and you want to persuade someone about your point of view, that your point of view is, is correct, you need to watch the tone of your essay. You need to keep it pretty flat. But at the same time, use arguments and use um, points, make points that will attack the currency of the person who's listening or reading your, your essay. Okay. If, if you're trying to convince them of something, if you get all emotional, then they're going to um, get their back up and think, you know, this person's trying to sell me something. Okay. But if you calm down, and you present arguments, and the arguments have to have to uh, be suitable to the audience you're talking to. Now, <clears throat> and the fact is, you might be right. Even if you're emotional, you might be right. But you won't be able to convince people unless you calm down and you use persuasive arguments. Now, um, there's a good example of that, uh, that I did when I, okay, like when the, when the Danish cartoon incident happened and this happened, well, I think it was in 2006. What happened was, um, uh, this guy in, in Denmark wanted to, uh, wanted to make a biography about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
And he wrote a terrible biography about, you know, calling him all kinds of names and referring to him as warm, war, warm mongery and all that kind of stuff. And then he went to some illustrators that he knew and he wanted to get it illustrated because it was a children's book. Now, all the illustrators he knew, they, um, they said, no, no, you can't illustrate Prophet Muhammad. The Muslims are going to get really upset about that. You can't do that. And he got really mad. So what he did was he went to the most racist newspaper in Denmark called Yilin's Posten. And he said to them, look at that. I wrote this biography of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Well, I'm saying peace be upon him. He didn't say that. But I wrote this biography and I can't even get it illustrated. So Yilin's Posten, now remember, this is a racist newspaper. What they did was they, they put out a call. They said, okay, let's get this illustrated. So they put out a call for 12 artists to draw the most uh, ridiculous cartoons they could about our prophet. Now, Muslims all over the world were furious and they were so upset because you see, in our culture, you, you, you don't illustrate the prophet because it, it's against our, our religion. And in fact, when I say the prophet's name, I'm supposed to add peace and blessings of God be upon him. We, are, we, we revere him so much. We respect him so much, but we're not allowed to worship him that we're supposed to put God's peace and blessings on him. So to insult him with cartoons, it's like a double whammy. Muslims all over the world, they started rioting. And even I was very upset about it. I was very upset about it. But I thought rioting and, and demonstrating is not going to do any good. Okay, but I got an opportunity to go to Denmark because they were having the International Board on Books for Young People Congress. Now, this is an organization for children's authors and for, for children's um, their professionals, like intellectuals, their educators, all kinds of stuff from all over the world were going to be there. So what you have to do when you have a certain emotional situation, like I said, don't start ranting and raving and stuff like that. You need to persuade people. So what I did was I, I contacted the people holding the Congress and I said, you know, I want to come there. I want to, and I want to talk about freedom of speech versus cultural sensitivity. So what I did was I created an essay and I gave a speech there in front of about 600 people. Now that's the way to persuade people. Now it might not have it might not have worked. I'm only one voice. But what you have to do is you have to do your best. You have to use your words and you have to use your ideas and you have to be able to to argue with people and persuade them that your course where you're coming from and that your course of action is beneficial beneficial to everyone. Now <clears throat> I'm going to continue this in my next, I'm going to do this in two parts because I've only scratched the surface about persuasion. But basically what I'm trying to say that you have to, don't be like a toddler who throws a tantrum when you don't get what you want. What you need to do is you have to learn how to persuade people. In the next um, session I want to do on persuasion, I'm going to talk about how um, people in dominant cultures react to people who are from from marginalized societies and remember i'm kind of coming from a marginalized society okay so i'm kind of on the edges but that doesn't mean that i i don't have good ideas and good um, arguments to share with the more dominant group and that's my whole point okay so that's the first part and i call this project hope because i'm actually trying to sow hope i'm trying to uh, help uh, people change the way they deal with each other so that we use our words instead of yelling and screaming and getting violent and all kinds of stuff. That's not called for. So instead I'm talking about how we can use our words to affect change and to make our wishes and our needs known so that everybody can get along. And that's all about persuasion. Don't forget to subscribe and see you next time.